Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we share all things people stuff in leadership. Learn from leaders who have done the hard yards and learn from experience. Hear from expert authors about the latest insights from culture to strategy and messy people dynamics. Get tips and insights from multiple award-winning author and leadership expert herself, Zoe Routh. Now, on with the show. Hi, it's Zoe, and guess what? You are in for a treat today. Our guest today is a NASA scientist turned Zen master, and she combines deep physical training with a rich scientific background with senior leadership at NASA. (laughs) She's amazing. This is a deep dive into the science of resonance and how we can show up more integrated and be more influential. So we don't touch on the science too much. That is heavily uh, revealed in her book, which I'll tell you about during the course of the session. But the rest of it is just completely amazing. And what you will find, listen to this, listen to her background. This is just so gobsmacking and cool. She has worked for years with organizations around the world like Merck, Novartis, J&J, HP, and Hilron. She worked for 10 years at NASA. She became the deputy manager for integrating the International Space Station, for which she received NASA's Exceptional Service Medal. She holds a PhD in biophysics, a Bachelor of Science in Physics, and a fifth degree black belt in Aikido. <laughs> She's the CEO of the Institute. I'm laughing because just just amazing. She's the founder and CEO of the Institute for Zen Leadership, and she is a Zen master in Rinzai Zen, and just an awesome human being. I love her latest book, which is called Resonate, Zen and the Way of Making a Difference. It is awesome book. I'm super excited. I love this conversation. I hope you enjoy it too. Let's do it. Ginny, all the way from Maryland, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thank you. I'm actually very super excited to talk with you about your latest book and your incredible journey. Uh, So I did, as I was saying before we hit record, I went through the first pass of your book. So what I do with any book is I do a big sweep through it to pick up the major bones of the book. And this is a real test of a book. If I think it's fabulous, I'll go back and actually read the whole damn thing properly. (laughs) Yours is even, it goes a step further, which is I need the print version of your book now because I want to really digest this book. So it's gone up <laughs> in <this type> of <laughs> recommendations in terms of awesome sauce. Oh. And I'm so excited to um, explore some of the key concepts in here. And I think it's the perfect book to complement what we're doing in this season of the podcast, which is about developing others. And the starting point is always self. So that was my, you know, accolades and excitement to have you on the call. So first question for you. You know, you worked at NASA and you became a Zen teacher, and now you run a Zen leadership training organization. Tell me first about landing in NASA. How did that happen? Well, it was a childhood dream, Zoe. When I was a kid, I I think I'd look up at the stars and I'd go, I want to go there. And in the United States at the time, going into space was just starting to happen. It was the most exciting thing a human being could do, in my view. I wanted to be an astronaut. So I wrote NASA when I was 13 years old, asking them like what classes to take in we call junior high school, you know, to best prepare me. And what was so funny is they wrote back saying it didn't matter, but you should take science and math in high school. And then in college, you should major in physics or aeronautical engineering or astrophysics. They gave me a whole list. And I followed that letter to the T. I went, took every science and math class under the sun. I got a degree in physics, a degree in biophysics. And not long after I was out of graduate school, there was a little ad that NASA was accepting astronaut applicants. So I had my application in the next day and they miraculously called me for an interview. And I went down there uh, and interviewed for the job. And the interview did not go that well, to be honest with you, <laughs> because I, and, and, I, and it was really it was really a learning for me in terms of how you can kind of mess up, because I was so concerned about trying to be perfect, like with all my answers. So, of course, I'm second guessing myself before the words are even coming out of my mouth. 
And they didn't make me an astronaut, but they said, you look kind of interesting. Why don't you come down here to the Johnson Space Center and get operational experience and maybe we'll look at you later. You know, maybe after you get more experience, you can uh, apply again. So I did that and I uh, started working at NASA. I think it really, for a while, I would say I was not listening to life, meaning I was so determined about this childhood dream that I was always trying to sort of game situations or be perfect in the eyes of all people so that NASA would give me this dream. And I don't know if you've ever lived that way, Zoe, but it is a soul sucking way to live because you don't even know who you are after a while. Well, what do you need me to be? You know, and did you notice me in that meeting? And I hope I didn't make you mad here. And I hope that was politically correct. And it was just, I felt like I was not authentic. And my body thought that too, as much as bodies can think, because they register their signals in terms of kind of an arrhythmic heartbeat in my case. But I didn't want NASA to find that out. You know, I didn't want NASA to know there was anything imperfect about me. So of course it had to get worse. And eventually it, it did. It landed me in an emergency room of a hospital where I realized I was, I had to change. I absolutely had to change. I was giving away my real life in service of a fiction. And two things really came out of that. One was I started listening to life in a new way and doing truly useful work for NASA because I was no longer worried about myself. And second, I started rising quickly through the ranks of leadership at NASA and taking leadership courses. And suddenly it was combining with something else that had been on my path since college. And that was a deep interest in martial arts and meditation. And when I was taking leadership classes, I could see that they really didn't combine the physical training that I knew so much from my training at the dojo that I thought could be so helpful to leaders. So it was starting to gnaw on me that this could be my calling. This could be the thing that I'm supposed to be working on. And of course, it didn't match my life at all. I was a scientist in a, a leading the integration of the space station. But it's funny how life conspires to give you opportunities. So I had an opportunity to revamp how we led the program, to learn everything I could about leadership and cross-functional teams, then left NASA. Uh, and started working with the people who actually ran leadership programs for NASA and started doing leadership development and executive coaching. That was more than 25 years ago. Wow. So there's a couple of things I want to pick up on in this incredible story. So going back to the point of the arrhythmia and landing up in hospital. So was that due to stress or was it due to just the function of your heart mechanism? Well, do we separate those two? <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> stress is such a stress is something that we take into our bodies, and it causes trouble. And I think that was certainly the case with me. I I don't know exactly how to tease apart all that was going wrong with my heart, but it was a sign to me, and certainly in hindsight, it was clear to me that it was a sign that my life was screwed up. That <laughs> because when I changed, it changed. You know, that, as I said, was more than 25 years ago, and I haven't had trouble with it since. So, wow. So, no trouble since. And so, th that point in time made you realize I need to give up this aspiration to become an astronaut. And what did that feel like? I mean, that was something that you held so strongly for so long. What was it like to let that go? Well, it was completely deflating, you know, in some respects, it was completely deflating. But it's almost like a pressure I'd been carrying for years lifted out of me. And I felt completely empty. It was also where even my Zen training changed at that point, because I'd been sitting in training in Zen, but I was kind of doing it, I'll call it on my terms. You know, I wanted Zen to make my life better. What I, you know, I wanted it to help me be an astronaut, you know, and make me more calm and relaxed and better focused and all those <laughs> things that meditation does, right? <laughs> But after I lost the dream, then I said, I don't know what my life's about. And so now I'm letting the training change me. And that's when it really does change us. It's when everything can flip around. And rather than trying to prove ourselves, we can become a much better instrument in service of others. Okay, this is a really powerful concept. So I think we'll just stay with this a little bit. You talked about listening to life and the practice helped you do that, I'm guessing. 
Is that correct? Absolutely. You know, you think about what is listening to life. It's paying attention. It's having your senses open where you register the energies around you. I mean, this was so clear to me in writing this most recent book called Resonate, because as a physicist at heart, that's how we take in energy. I mean, you're listening to me now, or the listeners are listening to both of us now, that energy of our voice is literally entering people's bodies and causing vibration. And then those vibrations lead to a set of chain reactions by which we make, we have perceptions, we make meaning, we make, come to assumptions and conclusions, and we might integrate it to other things we've learned that informs our actions. That whole chain reaction is an example of resonance. So as I was um, Flipping, I mean, is this was clear to me of how the meditation changes how we resonate because it makes us much more physically relaxed in the body, but sensitive to what's going on around us. So when you meditate for a while, it's almost like you can hear a pin drop as an example. That state is an example of how, in a way, you're more attuned to a wider sense of energy. But keep going and more and more energies become available. I'll call it a kind of intuition about what's going to happen or what trends are going on or the sense of this conversation or the, the feeling of a team or that you can read a room better. I mean, all of those are examples of signals you start picking up. So you're not as tone deaf in life, if you understand what I mean. Ooh, I like this. This is becoming developing superpowers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you know, I, I I never like to oversell, you know, what the effects of, of Zen training because you know individual results will vary. But it is extraordinary in my own experience, both as a teacher and as a practitioner. I, you know, I was told years ago by a great Zen teacher, Tanoi Roshi, sit twenty minutes a day; it'll change your life. And I was a scientist, so I thought, I'm going to run this experiment. And I have never known anyone for whom that's not true. And it certainly was true in my case. How did it change your life? Well, in my early life, you know, I was definitely a high need achiever, you know, like so many leaders are, right? You know, I mean, I was very ambitious and all that stuff. But what's underneath that? There is a deep insecurity under that of needing to prove myself, needing to perfect myself, needing. And then when I wanted NASA to give me my dream, I had to be even more perfect, if you understand what I mean. But that that drive, well, that's very self-focused. It's focused on serving basically an ego's concept of itself. What Zen flips around is it helps us not only first we see that ego, we see what we're doing, and then we see through that ego. We see who we are bigger and beyond that identity, that entity that's trying to steal our identity. <laughs> and we see through the ego and something can flip at that point, completely invert, where rather than there's a self frantically trying to prove that it's good enough, we can use whatever limits this self has, something limitless starts playing through it. A purpose plays through. So it's like we get out of our own way and now we can actually be an instrument of service rather than something that's trying to use the energy of life to further itself. That is such a powerful <laughs> comment and observation, instrument of service. I'm just making note of that. And um, I was talking to a friend this morning actually about similar stories where we're part of a community where it's an achiever, a community. There is, from a business point of view, there's certain levels you can achieve in your business and you get an award, an accolade, a, a status response as a result. And for me, I know I have, I get hooked by some of that achiever stuff. And it's a long-term pattern that I've been trying to unwind somewhat successfully and somewhat unsuccessfully. And we're talking about that, you know, having reached the highest level and then dropped back again in terms of my business performance. Uh, the ego part of me was like, ah, I feel less than because of that. Right. You know, even with a pandemic and all sorts of extenuating circumstances that were not necessarily a reflection of who I was and what I was doing. And then being able to just pick that up and park it as he has done. He's like, yeah, this is what I'm working on. And he's had incredible success in his business world and able to dial up and dial down. And it's not about his ego at all. It is definitely about service. And he is a 
avid meditator. He meditates three times a day and has done for years. And he's training to be a meditation teacher. So I love this idea. And it's something I write about in my, my latest book, People Stuff, where the switch is away from self and on to service to others. And if meditation helps us do that, sift through the ego stuff that keeps us trapped into the service piece. So finding purpose or discovering or unleashing purpose, I'm not sure what the exact word is or the correct word to encapsulate that. It's something that you talk about in your book, you know, accessing and allowing purpose. So if somebody's sitting there going, yep, I'm, I'm an achiever, I've got those traps as well, how would you suggest that they then move into this allowing space to unveil, reveal the purpose piece? It really is an, an allow and unveil rather than a go out and look for. <laughs> you know, right? Because often we think of purpose as something I go and seek or I have to have a visioning exercise and I have to think about what my purpose is. What I've come to realize is that purpose emerges when we are resonating with exactly the difference that is ours to make. In other words, <laughs> we are in a field of energy right now. I mean, that's the physical fact. It's talked about in an Eastern sense, probably much more holistically, you know, in, in Taoism and this idea of universal chi that flows through us and that we can cultivate through practices. In a Western sense, it's talked about as just a unified field of all kinds of energy, many of which we pick up through our senses. But whether we look at it from a Western view or an Eastern view, we are a vibrating sea of energy within a sea of energy. We are a mind-body instrument that can vibrate with certain kinds of energy to enact things. And I say the work of leadership is to turn the energy of ideas into things that matter. So what happens in the body is that the stuckness or tension or trauma of our life dulls our resonance and it confuses us around things like our purpose. I mean, we can we start second guessing or we get in that stuck stuff that you were just talking about with, with ego trying to prove itself and all that kind of stuff. So integrative practices that help us relax, that help us become coherent. And by coherent, I mean literally brainwaves, heart, <laughs> breathing, <laughs> or in the book, I talk about the head, the heart, and the hara, the lower abdomen, what Japanese call hara, can regulate the deepest, slowest breath in the body. And when we're able to get our whole system coherent, it's like we can just vibrate with, we can catch the wave of life itself rather than a whole lot of frantic scrambling. It's like more that feeling of swinging on a swing set like you did as a kid, where you could work with the larger forces around you and you could intuit, you could feel when was it time to pump your legs and when was it time to let go and just feel the system respond. That kind of naturalness is available to us as leaders when we relax rather than insist everything on our terms, when we listen rather than trying to force. And what emerges, the joy that emerges, the mind will translate into our purposefulness or our purpose in that situation. It becomes the significance of us being in that place or with that person or with that team at that point in time. In other words, what we call purpose is none other than the resonance of us with the field that we're a part of. And the more coherent and clear we are, the greater purpose we can enact. I love that. So that sort of helped me go, Mwah! <laughs> <laughs> doesn't it make you want to just relax and let it run through, right? That's why I say purpose plays through. It does. You know, when it's like we get, when we get out of the own, our own way, then there's no obstruction to the naturalness of us resonating with what is ours to do in the fields we show up in. That's a very peaceful, relaxing way to move into activity <laughs> or contribution. Absolutely. And, it, and that's why it's sometimes called wu wei. In the Chinese word wu wei, it speaks to effortless effort. It is the simplest, clearest, most resilient and joyful and effective way to lead. And what makes it difficult is it calls on the inner work to clear out the junk clear out the tension, clear out the broken places. Yeah. I think that's a really important place to dive into because 
so many of us are not Zen practitioners. And so we know perhaps that we've got some junk to clear out and we're not sure we may know what that is and don't know how to do it. So your book is full of very pragmatic steps to take to do that. What would be your starting place for somebody who goes, I've got some junk I want to clear out. I want to become more resonant. <laughs> I don't want the stuckness, this tension in my life. Where do I start? I always start with breath. And that's the first tool, the first layer of the toolkit that we unveil in, in Resonate, one breath. And even listening to this broadcast now, if you just let out a long, slow exhale, long, slow exhale, and you get curious about what's making this want to speed up, can start to feel into that tension or that, that little sense of urgency or something in us and see if you can relax that. The breath cycle has, you know, inhale and exhale. The exhale is the relaxing part of the breath cycle. So the longer and slower it is, the more the parasympathetic nervous system is just going to slow us down, going to settle us down. And then you take it in, in breath and start again, long, slow exhale. So in some ways, it, you know, could it be that simple? That is absolutely the starting place. And then getting curious about what would it take to breathe a little slower? What anxiety would I have to drop? Or what, what maybe I have to release my shoulders a little bit or sit up a little straighter to let that breath just drop through the body. And that process, which feels like just a deeply physical process, is actually clearing out the stuck points that otherwise impair our resonance. Literally and physically, when the brain waves and the heart waves cohere, which from the wonderful research at the HeartMath Institute happens at about a tenth of a hertz, every 10 seconds or a tenth of a hertz, and then the breath can support it by coming in, say, every 20 seconds or every 30 seconds, we get the whole system to add up. So the place to start is to work, what do I have to release and relax in my body to let the head, the heart, and the breath, or the hara, to just add up. That's a great way to start working through the tension that otherwise blocks our resonance. That's a very different approach than, let's talk about your childhood <laughs> and, you know, the patterns that are existing there. Is there a place for cognitive aspects of this to look at the, the frustrations and stories we've got going on? Or is it defaulting to this energetic field? There's absolutely a place for it because that's another door into the room, as it were. But, you know, when you think about mind-body as one integrated system, the mind, and I love Dan Siegel's definition of mind, an embodied relational process that directs the flow of energy. So think about that for a moment, an embodied relational process that's directing the flow of energy. And then you say, well, what's the body? The body is a physical material form that is sensing and directing energy. So you've got this mind and body that's constantly working with energy and changing its form. So if we've had some traumatic experience in our childhood, it's going to result in some tension in the body. It's going to have a physical signature as well as a, and we may have a memory of it or not have a memory of it. If the memory is, is bad enough, we may have blocked access to it. And this is a mechanism well studied now in neuroscience where people can dissociate from traumatic experiences and no longer have explicit recall of things that happen. So the mind and body end up not agreeing on what their experience is. That's an example of a break in our system that's going to very much dull our resonance. How can we reclaim it? If you can't find it with the mind, find it in the body. If you can't find it in the body, maybe the mind can get there. You know, maybe the stories of your childhood will help. But what I always encourage people when they go back to their childhood is don't stop there because your story didn't start with your childhood. <laughs> you, know, it's, you, know, you think about the generations of intergenerational trauma and social context and the culture you grew up in and all the history behind that. We're doing the work of generations through these bodies. And the challenge when people can go back one step to maybe where something came from in their life is they may start blaming somebody. And that blaming behavior doesn't actually help clear the problem. It's almost like, again, we need to flip that around to accepting 
those conditions themselves were the result of other conditions. How can I accept that this is functioning in me and not let it stop me? How can I co-create with this condition rather than let it be a stumbling block? Wow. Um, I got emotional there. That obviously tripped something in me. <laughs> Just thinking about some of the context from which I came in historical generational traumas that are sitting there. And if I think about what's happening in the United States as well, the manifestation of intergenerational trauma that's happening in so many different communities, that's all at play. In the book, one of the big things you talk about is like the final one in the last chapters is practices for big change agents. Maybe it's wrong to jump to that now, but let's have a go because if it starts with like, it starts with self, right? You need to get your own coherence and your own energy vibration going well before you start thinking about being a big societal change. Talk to me about that. So when you're sitting in how to be a big change agent, where do you start? What happens there? Where do you start? Um, and, and as you point out, that's kind of where, where we culminate in our exploration of resonance in the book. Because when you think about applying it, as you say, it starts inside out. And then it starts with our relationships. It progresses to our goals and ideas that we're trying to manifest in the world. And then to teams we may be working with. And then to systems. And then to societies. You know, So there's kind of, again, nested layers. But the principle is similar. When we're working with change on a big scale, there's really four conditions we need to look for, for how well they're supporting the change. Because we have to be clear-eyed about all the forces that are contributing to the condition as it is right now. There's a lot of karma is playing out and it's not all going to change because you or I want it to. That, be that becomes unrealistic. That would be like sitting on the swing set and expecting it to operate like a roller coaster. It's not going to do that. It's a swing set. And it has certain principles it operates with, and, and similarly our societies. But the four conditions that we can look for are first, is there a necessity for this social change or for this thing we're trying to catalyze? And is there a unifying sense of perceiving that necessity? The second thing is, is there connection and interdependence on it? Are we all in this together, so to speak? Or is there a very divided, politicized, polarized response? So can we get a community together that really cares about this and has a way to communicate on this change? The third one is, does everyone know what to do? Is there personal agency in it? So people can act. We can't make change happen by just thinking about it. There have to be actions that we're feeding the field with new energies that can create chain reactions. And the fourth thing, is there a way for those efforts to add up? Are there some systems or, and this is also where leadership can be so important, to create galvanizing events or targets or things that will focus or attenuate energy so that it can add up to a larger wave. Because again, when you look at it from a physics point of view, you're trying to get waves to add up to a greater amplitude to hit some point where there can be what Malcolm Gladwell called a tipping point or a phase shift into a new state. And in order to reach that point, you need to get the efforts of individuals to add to something greater. And that means there has to be some kind of alignment of personal agency toward things that add up. So having a unifying purpose, connection and interdependence, personal agency, and a way to add up can be a guide for change agents to feel into which of those conditions maybe need some attention in a change I care about. And then how can I use my relationships, because it'll go back to inside out and then the relationships we can structure, to further some of those? What goals might I set around some of them? How can our team work on some of them? You know, so we can go back to working with how to strengthen those conditions that things can add up. So we might dive back to the starting point, you know, personal residence, residence, personal resonance, and one of the second part, of, there's the whole exploration in, in that chapter about practices that you can do, including the breath work. And then you talk about healing relationships and developing coherence with other. I think that is also a massive opportunity and stumbling block for others. So what do we do there? So we've got, sometimes we have fractious relationships with others. What can we do in order to handle that, relieve it, heal it? Yeah, it's another great way to find and work on those stuck points in ourself. 
because if, if you and I were just sitting here saying, well, how do I clean out the stuff in myself? You, you wouldn't know where to look. But fortunately, yeah. relationships give us an opportunity because anytime we're triggered or into conflict or into it in one of our relationships, it's truly showing us something about ourselves. There's something about us that is afraid or protecting itself, or there's some stuck point in there that gives us a chance to work it. And again, we can't heal or change the other person, but by how we look at ourselves or work with that fear or stuck point in myself, I can heal the relationship. I mean, for example, if there's someone who we're just not in resonant with. It is a non-resonant relationship. We keep missing each other. We end a conflict. I'm thinking of a person who used to argue with me and fight with me all the time, and it would make me feel terrible. And I ended up walking on eggshells around this person because I didn't want to trigger her into yelling at me or something like that. So initially, we tend to blame out there. You know, we think, oh, that person didn't do a good thing. You know, I, they're not a good person. But forget looking at the other person. When I turn my eye inward and I say, what is my hook into this? What is triggering in me about this? What am I afraid may be true about me? Now I'm going to start to trace the root of fear, which is one of the things we really look at and resonate, is how to trace the roots of fear in myself. Well, maybe I'm afraid that I'm not a very good person, or I'm not good enough, or I'm not lovable, or I'm going to be exposed as a phony. Mm, now I'm starting to hit some pay dirt here. And if I can own that that fear may be operating in me and still ask, what can I do anyway? What am I free to do anyway? Okay, so maybe this fear is operating in me and it's changing how I feed the field of this relationship. But let's just say okay, I've got this fear, what can I do anyway? You almost want to bring it so close it has no room to operate. And from that place, you can see, well, I'm free. I can be kind to her. I can love her. I can lift her up. I can help her develop. You know, I have no hook into it whatsoever. I can, I'm free to do any of these things when I quit worrying about me. So by penetrating to the root of fear, owning that, yes, for whatever karmic conditions that may be operating in me, what do I still have the power to do? We can claim our power to act in those relationships in a way where we're not stuck. And when we're not stuck, we're healing the relationship. It's going to get better. And in fact, the one I was just talking about did get better. <laughs> so it's, it heals it. That old line we have about it takes two to tango. It takes two stuck people to have a conflict. And if one person frees herself up, the relationship may never be the closest in the whole world, but it's at least functional again. And sometimes the other person will free, it'll free up something in them too. It's amazing how we can hold stuckness in place in one another. So I always say, don't worry about changing other people, change myself, and other people will respond in ways true to them. Let me just check on one part of what you just explored. So you, when you dive into that fear, like you follow the fear down, as you say, and you hold it close and really say, it's there. What can I do anyway? You're not trying to get rid of the fear or erase it, are you? You're just... You're seeing through it. Okay. You're saying, so this is functioning. You know, it's <laughs> it's a... It's a part of this instrument. It's just in there. I mean, my right hip is higher than my left hip. That's just part of the fact of what I'm working with. It doesn't mean I can't work with it. It's almost like the more you can just accept what's going on, not as a limit that makes it impossible to be free, but as a condition that you'll have to work with in order to be free. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it may cause a limp, <laughs> say, for example... <laughs> And it's like, okay, this is the limp, and what can I do anyway? And what can I do anyway? In, in some sense, we're all disabled. <laughs> you know, we're all disabled. And, and you, it, you, no matter how many years of meditation you do, I mean, I've had it for four decades now. There's still all kinds of stuff in me that, you know, it's just the way this system was put together, but it's by no means perfect. <laughs> you know? It's by no means, I mean, it, there's all kinds of junk in there. And it's much easier for me to see through it now and be free anyway. I love that. 
So if you're thinking about enlightened masters, have they cleaned out all their junk or they still have junk too? No, they still have junk. No, and Ken Wilber talks about this in a really interesting way because there are different lines of development, he would say. You know, a spiritual line, a physical line, a language line, a, you know, whatever. Lots of different ways we can develop because he was really exploring the question of how is it that some people can be so spiritually advanced but so lousy in relationships or something like that, have so little emotional intelligence or whatever. And so he really, you know, was developing a model to, to try to account for how it is that we really develop along a lot of different lines. And we grow up through different stages and levels of development through our life from little kids, you know, in a very narcissistic stage of development, young in life, to becoming more empathetic, more rational, more multi-perspectival as we grow up. I mean, that's the kind of development business you and I are in, right? We, we concern ourselves with this. But there's, I think, no one who gets a, a free pass, meaning there's no one who comes into life as a blank slate. You know, we all have, we all have, uh, we're all born in relationship. We all come up through relationship. We all have a DNA heritage that's going to condition us in certain directions, right? We all come into a culture that's going to condition us in certain directions. So we all have, we all have work to do about how we pair this differentiated self with the conditions around us, much less with universal energy. Lovely. Thank you. All right. I have one further question. <laughs> and it just adds to your level of coolness, the fact that you wrote about the Navy SEALs in your book. <laughs> so I'm a little bit obsessed with Navy SEALs. And I managed to interview one recently on the podcast, a former US Navy SEALs. And you talk about team flow. And uh, Stephen Kotler's book also talks about team flow and cites the US Navy SEALs. And you have you have another insight around that. When we talk about that collective resonance in a team, what do you see are the contributions or the steps to do that? And what are the advantages of doing it? Well, first, I want to give credit to Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel, whose story of the Navy SEALs I really was drawing from in, in the book. And what they were noticing is that they shared this story about these Navy SEALs having to walk about a mile, hike to mile to where their target was, where they had a very, you know, a life and death mission ahead of them. And the importance of what they called making the switch, the merge, where they would quit being individuals and become as one. That it's what we would call a group samadhi from a meditative state or a flow state that is a field in which all the people are in sync and in a sense can finish each other's sentence or we think and we can naturally move from lead leadership from person to person from who knows what to do next. That condition uh, the, the SEALs have found was essential to their kind of missions. So what induces it is, again, this ability, there has to be a challenging need. There has to be you know, a, a necessity that demands our full attention. We have to be in it together. So this sense of connectedness, we have to know what to do and be trained for our roles. And we have to have a way for that effort to add up. So in a way, similar things to what we saw with the social change, but on the scale of a team, it can be a kind of hive connectivity or hive consciousness that literally entrains people's brainwaves to a point where one thing is going on that's holding individual actions within an energetic field where no one will fail, no one will be left behind. I love how you take that what felt like an esoteric experience down to the scientific explanation of wavelength resonance and how we can collectively take our focus and our energy and create that. It's amazing. What's so cool is that now in this day and age, people can strap on these EEG headsets with, you know, all the electrodes and you can measure this stuff. It isn't like, <laughs> it isn't like we're just talking about crystals and fantasy. You can measure when when two people are in resonant communication, how their brain waves line up. So it's, this is something that where the science and the subjective experience are really supporting each other in terms of, you know, we've long said things like we're getting on the same wavelength. And yeah, well, that's pretty true. <laughs> that's pretty much the case. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, Ginny, this, I could talk to you all day. I know you don't have all day. And where can people find out more about you and your work and your book? Oh, thank you. Uh, resonatethebook.com is a great place to go where they can get 
not only find out how to get the book, but also there's some companion videos that show all those exercises you were talking about. Fantastic. <laughs> right. So you can play along with the videos on resonatethebook.com. And then some courses. We're doing a course on Resonate starting in February, and there's information on that course right on that page as well. That's another way people can dive into this work. That's lovely. Ginny, thank you so much. This has been very awakening for me and instrumental. I'm so excited to get your book in hard copy to digest <laughs> more fully and to play along with your videos and so on. So thank you again. This has been great. Thank you, Zoe. There's so much to take away from this interview. I'm not sure what my favorite part was. You know what? It's just wonderful hanging out with her. <laughs> it's just got this energetic field. Surprise from a Zen master who focuses on resonance. I think that was like the first thing, just how good you feel around somebody who has got coherence in their head, heart, and hara. So they're breathing and all their wavelengths sync up. Uh, so that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway is just using the breath, accessing the breath to relax and help relax any of the other tensions that might exist in the body and the energy field. And the, probably the third takeaway is the idea, notion, practice of when you amplify your energy in connection with others, how you can actually create a wave of new energies out there in the world. Very cool. Love this. If you love this interview, please rate and review the podcast. It does make a big difference. That's social proof that this is a worthy podcast to listen to. And if you enjoyed it and would like to share that you did, feel free to email me, zoe at intercompass.com.au. Love to hear your stories of resonance and what you're experiencing out there. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast with leadership expert, Zoe Routh. For more about people stuff and to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com.